first, two soundbite answers for why trans is anti-science, which might be instant argument winners. First, a scientific fact that there are, within each person, 37 trillion discrete pieces of DNA evidence of their gender, namely sex chromosome pairs, which are all unanimously either XX or XY. And to disregard the voice, the sheer weight, the roar of the voice of this evidence is unscientific. Second, transgender advocates implicitly admit that their concept of gender is fake every time that they call gender a human construct. What they mean by this is that it is thought up, not in the lab, but in human minds. To this, you merely need to distinguish the real concept of gender, which is the same as sex, and which is binary, from theirs, which comprises now in 2023, a hundred plus genders. You will almost surely win this argument if you merely point out that having a hundred plus genders qualifies as a classic reduction to the absurd, reductio ad absurdum, something that people often do to discredit others as arguments, but which they are doing on their own to discredit their own argument. For everyone knows that nature produces a hundred of nothing, but only two of each thing at each evolutionary juncture. Now, they'll have no argument of response to this, because being a reduction to the absurd, that's just a take it or leave it appraisal. Either you deem a hundred plus genders to be absurd, or you don't. However, in response to your other point, the 37 trillion sex chromosome pairs inside each transgender person, to that, transgender advocates will pivot and say, oh, but that's biological sex, whereas gender is something different from sex. They may even elaborate and clarify, sex is what is defined at birth, whereas gender is just a cultural human construct. And so presumably one may therefore redefine one's gender since it's a mere human construct. To shoot this down, you need a strong, cohesive philosophy of human nature, something most people, even most scientists, have never studied. But fear not, I have, and by the end of this video, you'll be an expert at it too. You either have to have a bodacious diagram like this, or this, or a newspaper column like this, or you have to mentally construct it for them by way of illustration. It could be a hierarchy of sciences, some being more basic and fundamental than others, or it could be a hierarchy of structures that those sciences study, again, some being more basic and fundamental than others. But regardless, you have to demonstrate that the levels of the hierarchy are vertically connected so that disputes at higher levels are resolved by recourse to lower levels, and therefore lower levels in turn, define those higher levels, setting the rules and limits for them. Now, if they deny that levels of human nature need to be vertically connected at all, such as by saying, oh, you can be one sex and a completely different gender, then you need to recall them back to honesty with a little metaphysical perspective, with a hypothetical argument that in theory, all things should be vertically connected, metaphysically self-united. Here, you need to emphasize the importance of human harmony, consistency, and order, that higher levels of a being ought to be in orderly union with their constituent pieces. If they aren't, then it's an anomaly, an inconsistency, a disorder, a lack of integrity, perhaps even a two-part split or dichotomy. A being which is well interunited with itself will be a true synthesis and display the virtue of integrity. But beings which are not self-united, not harmonious, not consistent, they will experience great psychological or physical strain and end up with physical or mental problems such as bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, 
maybe even psychopathy or sadomasochism. Note, you'll want to get these virtue value words on the tip of your tongue ready to go, since their mere mention can be an instant argument winner. For very often, a person arguing against you has forgotten a particular virtue or value whose mere mention may rack their world and change their whole perspective. So, after you've gotten them to acknowledge the need for vertical integrity, then you can move on to demonstrating how lower levels of human nature define higher levels, including those higher levels as aspect of gender. For example, if you have two boys and one has breasts and the other doesn't, then you can look at a lower level, at their hormones, to see if one has a particular hormone that is over or under expressing. Or even better, you can look all the way down at DNA to see what hormones ought to be being expressed, and even what gender each individual ought to be. Now, anywhere along here, but especially if you just mentioned a boy with breasts, they'll be unable to resist a second pivot, throwing at you the old piecemeal exceptions argument. Yeah, they'll say, there are all sorts of intersex people. They'll say, people having opposite sex organs, both sets of sex organs, or DNA mutations, or transgender hormonal feelings, or bigender hormonal feelings, transsexual hormonal attractions, bisexual hormonal attractions, infinite kinds of such intersex people. This kind of argument, this denial of universals, this assertion that every being is its own separate kind, so that macro groupings like whole races, or whole genders, or even whole bodies, or even as little as whole organs, or whole cells, have no physical basis and don't really exist, but are just like abstract containers, human constructs, this view is actually a huge thing in the history of philosophy. It's called nominalism, held by people like William of Ockham, Martin Luther, Locke and Hobbes, David Hume, Kant. All these people in the realist column, who are normally our allies when arguing against a dogma as bizarre as transgender. For this worldview, this nominalism, is actually a kind of super hyper-realism in which the top level of human nature, one's transcendent mind, is disacknowledged from existing, even in oneself. And its acceptance creates a worldview which is nearly conventional, not scientifically accurate, and in which real things are infinitely granular and piecemeal, unknowable in themselves, which is all, of course, quite stifling and depressing. For suddenly one cannot know any common essences, nor identify in common with any other human being. For each being is different from every other, and thus every beheld creature must merely be accepted for what it can say about itself, and not judged. For how can an apple judge an orange? All we can do is sing kumbaya to one another in silent worship of the unique prodigy that each being is. To nominalists, then, gender and all other categories are merely conventional, and so having a hundred plus genders is just fine, and scientists fall for this all the time. To debunk this madness, this self-imposed ignorance and mental blindness, you need to resurrect either of the Aristotelian concepts of essences or natures, for the, those two are the same thing, natures being merely essences viewed under the aspect of their origin. Now, if you can get them to acknowledge the higher concept of essences, that'll be slightly more powerful, because natures are normally associated with the, with the material realm, which is the realm that they comfortably acknowledge, whereas getting them to acknowledge essences would force them to suddenly acknowledge an entire spiritual rational realm, which could be an instant argument winner. To get them to acknowledge essences or natures, you need to distinguish between what is general and the exceptions, between the essential and the incidental. Philosophers would say the accidental. For those nominalists are thinking of everything as incidental exceptions. Therefore, generously acknowledge that, yes, 
exceptions exist, but consistently contrast those exceptions with the general whole. Buttress up the general as, in size, frequently occurring, in causation, triggered by successful design, either God's or Mother Nature's, in its origin or genesis, orderly, organic, and normal, in its governmental management, as easy and standard, in its homeopathic naturalness, as organic, in its viability, therefore, as a very good bet, and therefore, in its destiny, as a good bet. Conversely, disparage the incidental, as in size, rarely occurring, in causation, as triggered by events either artificial, if human-made, or accidental, if caused by luck, in its origin or genesis, as non-conforming, non-conventional, and thus disordered. Therefore, from the perspective of, the, of its governmental management, disorderly, in its homeopathic naturalness, as a disorder. Therefore, its specific difference, as detrimental. Therefore, its viability, as doubtful, and its destiny as highly, highly doubtful. Your goal is to distinguish enough differences to, so as to crystallize two separate categories in their minds, the general essential natural normal and the incidental. Now let's be honest here. Somewhere along this argument, 90% of them will run away. And you should take this as an act of semi-surrender, a subtle telegraphing to you that Deep within their psyche, they know that you are correct to some degree, and that they don't currently have the intellectual tools to oppose you. And so they need to go think about it in isolation to try to develop those counter arguments against you, lacking which they might even decide to agree with you. This is exactly what you want, because it's only in the inner sanctum of their mind that they can freely decide for themselves to what new degree they want to agree with you. Maybe even full, full agreement. So don't antagonize them with arrogant nastiness, rubbing it in. Your goal is to make them an honored brother, not a slave. But if they stay, then at this point, you've established that there is an essence, a kind of humanness. And so now you can drive home that point that humanness at is, at its most basic, fundamental DNA level, binary. And there you've won the argument. And you might even be able to receive a couple other windfalls that might just fall into your lap at this point, if they are intrigued. For instance, things like treatment will then necessarily mean restoring and promoting that binariness, not reversing it or blurring it. In the name of promoting that binariness, then now you can also rise up into the cultural epiphenomena that come from nature, up into the animal and rational realms, where you have things like population dynamics and civic policy. And therein, you can argue that things like social roles, pastimes, even garments, are most beneficial and salutary when they promote binariness, not when they celebrate deviancy. Hence, mainstream nature and culture should be celebrated most, whereas today's fashionable catch-all grab bag omnibuses of the ilk of LGBTQIAA++ ism or just diversity should be celebrated less. When someone says, oh, I'm non-conforming, the response should be a sincere, I'm sorry for you. Your elders must have been very uninspiring. We hope to change that. In conclusion then, we've established that the most definitive evidence in science is the lowest, most minuscule particles, and that all higher epiphenomena must and needs be in conformity with those particles or else they are objectively disordered against that being's nature or essence. Transgender theory not only fails to even try to integrate the testimony of those particles, but it straight up completely ignores and contradicts the voice of those particles, 
and thus it is against science, is ontologically false, and is therefore unhealthy, and dare I say it, dangerous, at all levels of existence. Hi, I'm David Rudman. I'm the most knowledgeable systematic theologian in the world. Not because I know systematic theology better than others, although I do, but because I've developed my cohesive understanding of the classical philosophy upon which it is built better and further than others have. In which fields, if you want to be as good as I am, perhaps you should watch this video here, whose first half is philosophy and whose second half is theology.